All right, everybody, open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 3. Matthew, chapter 3. Matthew, chapter 3. We left off last time with John the Baptist, verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then verses 8 and 9. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Meet for repentance, there in verse 8. When two things meet each other, they are equal. Uh, but for Adam, there was not found in help meet for him. Genesis 2, verse 20. He didn't have a <clears throat> partner equally suited to him uh, until Eve was created. Fruits meet for repentance would be some fitting indication that the person was interested in want and wanted to repent before God and in the sight of God. They were serious about it. Verse 10 says, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. The trees are pictures of individuals, and I'll give you a text for that in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, verses 17 to 19. And trees are also a picture of the nation of Israel and other nations. Luke 21, verses 29 and 30. Fruits, in this case, uh, which prove real repentance, are, are listed in Luke's account of all this. Go forward to the book of Luke, chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. <clears throat> I'll give you a second to find it. Maybe two seconds. Luke 3. And begin at verse 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answered and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, or food, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Boy, if you could find a half dozen Americans who are content with their wages, you'd be finding something these days. Once again, we find the Church of Rome, or Roman Catholicism, prescribing what penance to do in the confessional. They have a sort of a legalistic bent, and they can't seem to get out of the Old Testament very often. But verse 10, back in our text, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. In our, uh, um, um, that which doesn't bring forth, in, in the case of the believer, to not bring forth good fruit as a believer is going to mean you don't get any rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Um, in fact, let me give you a, a text to sort of reinforce that thought. In 
In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul writes to that church in Corinth, and there is a man uh, in the church, in the assembly, who was fooling around with his either his mother or his stepmother, probably a stepmother of some kind. The Bible doesn't specify. And uh, Paul rebukes him for, this, for letting this thing go on and nobody setting the guy straight, nobody uh, addressing it. And he says, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 4 and 5, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Some people who are saved, they've been born again by the saving power of God, and the, uh, they've been washed clean by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, by faith in the blood of Christ. And yet, from that moment on, they never seek to do anything for the honor of Jesus Christ. They don't get started reading their own Bible to learn more about the Lord. They don't form a, a desire to be with other Christians and see if they might benefit from them and their experience. They don't offer to pray for some other Christian or uh, ask another Christian to pray for them. They got their salvation, and it might be genuine. It might be absolutely genuine, but someone who doesn't form a new desire to serve God in some way, to serve Jesus Christ, uh, will not be earning or bringing forth any kind of fruit that honors the Lord Jesus. Nothing to show for his or her credit uh, when they face the Lord Jesus in judgment one day. But in this case, here's a guy fooling around with his, his stepmother, and uh, Paul says to deliver that guy to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Just back off and ask God to kill the guy. He's not going to get right. Ask God to kill him so he doesn't do any more damage to the whole assembly. You know, your reputation is damaged by me if I go out and I mess up because you and I are part of the same body. And uh, mine would be damaged by you likewise because people associate us with each other. When the TV preachers got caught, you know, with their hand and everybody's wallet and everybody's purse getting rich uh, off the backs of little grandmas, they say, and Dear precious partners, tuck in their love gift. I've got my grandmas praying out there. Yeah, and they're sending as much money as they can to keep you rolling around in your uh, Mercedes Benz and your Rolls Royce. Meanwhile, they can barely eke out enough to pay their bills every month. When they got caught uh, with their hands uh, uh, full of everyone else's money and uh, messing around with uh, women and so on, Everybody else who's an ordinary Christian got tarnished in, by association because you and I, whether we are aware of it all the time, we are in the same body of believers. And sometimes we don't think of it that we think, well, our church is this and their church is that, and we're right, they're wrong, and, but those issues were, you know, someone's right, somebody's wrong, those are not the issues of salvation. If you have your soul saved by the blood of Christ and the grace of God, you might disagree about a lot of little, little things. But the world doesn't think of it that way. They say they're Christians. You say you're a Christian. He says he's a Christian. And in their mind, you're all just part of the same group. So when one person messes up, all Christians get tarnished and broad brush to make everybody guilty by association. It shouldn't be that way. But unfortunately, it is. The world doesn't see, well, the Baptists don't do it that way, but the Lutherans do, or the Episcopalians uh, do it differently, but the Presbyterians have a different way of doing it. There may be saved, born-again people in every single one of those churches. They may be preaching bad doctrine, false doctrine, but there may be born-again men and women, part of the body of Christ, part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, in any one of those groups and more, uh, but when one, so, so you can't say, well, that's them and we're us. The world, the unsaved world doesn't look at you that way. They look at one Christian, they, they think that Roman Catholicism and the Pope, that's Christianity. They think JWs are Christianity. 
They think Mormons are Christianity. They think any number of oddball, screwball groups are Christianity. They think, you know, the, the, the one, <laughs> they, they even think uh, Jesse Duplantis and Benny Hinn are a part of Christianity. They, hey, I'm not those men's judge. Maybe they're born again. Maybe they are born again. But they sure are, they sure got their hand in everybody else's wallet. Anyway, your testimony as a believer can be damaged if I go out and mess around and fool around. And so Paul says to the church in Corinth, you back off and pray that God kills that guy so he doesn't do any more damage to the, the whole body by association. He says, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Boy, if that's not eternal security, I don't know what is. If that's not a good case for eternal security, you couldn't make one. There's not a better case for someone being saved and kept saved by the power of Christ and the grace of Christ than that. Some guy, it doesn't get much worse than some guy and his stepmother shacking up together. And God says, hey, that shouldn't be. Let God kill that guy. He doesn't do any more damage to the rest of you. And uh, for the destruction of the, of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So, back to the main idea of our text, fruits meet for repentance, worthy of repentance. John came preaching, and uh, these people, the, the Jews that came to his baptism in the Jordan River, if they listened to him, he was an Old Testament prophet. He was an Old Testament prophet before the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. In fact, John the Baptist was born six months before Christ was. He was an Old Testament prophet, and they hadn't had one like him in a few hundred years. And if they would submit to his preaching and obey his admonition to be baptized unto repentance, the Messiah is on the way. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. The Messiah is just about to appear. And if you want to be right with him when he does, submit to baptism, show, show that you're serious about repenting of your sins by that act. And those, evidently, that submitted to John's baptism welcomed the Lord Jesus when John pointed him out. He said in John 1, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And people turned to the Lord Jesus from that time on. But uh, verse 9 in our text, again, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And yet that's exactly what they did later on. John chapter 8, verse 39, they said to Christ, Abraham is our father. That's exactly what they said to him. This is called a covenant theology by some groups uh, in modern times. The faith of their fathers was their alibi for rejecting the Lord Jesus when he showed up. Since you belong to a certain group or to a certain race or to a certain um, club or organization, somehow your spiritual uh, eternity, your spiritual blessings are going to come automatically and don't work that way. Doesn't work that way. But this was the pride of the Jew. And the best thing you could say to that covenant theology, well, our ancestors used to preach this four or five hundred years ago in uh, Germany or in England, is hogwash. That's the best response to that. Now, verses 11 and 12 in our text today. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is a very important passage in the scriptures. To compare scripture with scripture reveals that John's baptism unto repentance was primarily a Jewish ministry. Look forward at Romans chapter 15. Keep your finger here. Romans 15. Look at 
Romans 15. And notice there verses 8 and 9. Paul writes, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. That would be Israel. To confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, For this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing praises unto thine, or rather, and sing unto thy name. So Christ came first primarily uh, to the Jew to the nation of Israel. His ministry was first to the nation of Israel. John, uh, or Paul, writes in, in Romans chapter 1, that Christ came to the Jew, uh, salvation to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. John never claimed that his baptism had anything to do with New Testament salvation, the way you and I have uh, received it. He says, and I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. John 1, verse 31. John is careful to contrast his water baptism unto repentance with Jesus Christ's baptism of the Holy Ghost unto salvation. This distinction needs to be kept in mind. Um, after the events here, Matthew chapter 3, Christ began to show himself to the nation as John the Baptist was baptizing. After this, Christ himself baptizes, uh, uh, never baptizes, I should say, anyone in water. Look forward at John chapter 4. John 4, and uh, verses 1, 2, and 3. John, <clears throat> excuse me, John chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, parentheses, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. After Calvary and the resurrection, none of the apostles except Paul are baptized in water under a new covenant. You don't read about any of the apostles being baptized as New Testament believers after the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul is baptized, he's baptized by a fellow Jew named Ananias before any New Testament revelation had come before any books of the New Testament were uh, written yet, following the Jewish customs of purification laid out in Leviticus and Numbers, uh, look forward at Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. I know I'm moving around a lot to a lot of scripture, but we were preaching on the street corner several years ago down in Garden Grove, and Garden Grove, of course, was famous because Robert Schuller's Crystal Cathedral was up and running at that time. I remember yelling at the cars passing by the intersection, uh, we're out here on the street corner because Robert Schuller is not out, out, out here on the street corner. He's not going to do it. We're going to do it. But Paul is baptized by a fellow Jew uh, following the laws of purification. That's all he knew. Didn't have any other revelation yet. Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, Ananias says, Now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's what Jews did for purification. They indicate they wanted to show some sense of purity, some sense of contrition for their sin, some sense of repentance before God. Our text back in Matthew 3 and verses 11 and 12 clearly define three separate baptisms. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 4, 
Paul writes, for there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And um, a lot of people take that and they say all in instances of water baptism or any time the word baptism shows up, it always means water baptism of some sort. It all means the same thing. Now, if you're not comparing Scripture with Scripture, you're going to get confused. If you don't compare Scripture with Scripture and let the Scriptures filter out wrong ideas and teach themselves, then you can come away with a false idea. Uh, there are actually seven different baptisms mentioned in the Word of God. I'll give you the texts for them. Three found right here in Matthew 3, verses 11 and 12. One is found in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 and 2. Another one found in Matthew 20, verse 22. Another one in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Another one in Matthew 28, verse 19. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, Paul says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. That happens the moment you get saved. You become part of the body of believers. You become part of the body of Jesus Christ. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, of the Holy Ghost. The moment you trust Christ to save your soul, quicken your dead spirit by his power. Well, that's going to match the baptism of the Holy Ghost found in our text, which then would leave us with only six baptisms in the Word of God. A seventh one, then, can be added in 1 Peter 3, verse 21, where God describes Noah and his household being saved by water in the flood. And this is the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. And that's where all the cult members stop. See, water baptism is necessary to be saved. Water baptism is necessary to be saved. And they don't read on. Uh, Peter explains what he means by that. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Water baptism doesn't cleanse you of whatever sins you're guilty of. Whatever sins you've ever committed in this body, uh, water baptism doesn't cleanse you or clean you up from those. He says, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. That's the function of water baptism now. It's the answer of a good conscience. It's to testify that I have been saved. I have been forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is my way of illustrating it. In a sense, my old nature is buried in the water. It comes up a new nature once, who wants to serve Jesus Christ now. I'm anticipating the day my body lays down in death and it rises again in glorified power. I'm identifying myself with the death and the burial and the resurrection of my Savior who rose again in glorious power. I am anticipating the day um, uh, I lay my head down on a pillow of death or in a casket of some sort, and that body comes forth alive once again. You're picturing all of those things by water baptism. Water baptism is a picture of your salvation. It's not the means of it. You can be a, a lost a dry sinner, get wet, and come up a wet sinner. You're not any more saved than you were that day, moment before. Water baptism doesn't save any. In fact, let me show you something. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians 15. And start, uh, well, verses 3 and 4 are sufficient. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. This is what we call the gospel, what Paul calls the gospel there in, uh, in verse 1. 
Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scripture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel Paul was sent out to preach. It didn't require anything more than that. Look, for, look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The same book by the same author, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Notice what Paul says about the importance of water baptism. Verse 16. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. I don't even know how many I might have baptized. Verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. You know what that means? That means the gospel that saves doesn't require water baptism. It, doesn't, it requires faith. The dying thief next to Christ didn't have a chance to get baptized in water, and yet Jesus died before he did, so he was the very first one to believe on the death of Jesus Christ because Christ died before the thieves were, were fin finished off. So he was the very first one to get in, the church uh, believing in the death of it had happened right next to him. Think about that scene. The guy hanging on a cross next to Christ, he, he witnesses the crucifixion, and his faith in it was sufficient just a few minutes, a few moments afterwards, because they came along to break the soldier's legs, the, the criminal's legs, and uh, when they came to Christ, they found he was already dead, so they didn't have to break his bones. They broke their legs to hasten their death, that means Christ died before they did. And that's all the time it was necessary for Christ to um, open a gate to uh, eternity and permanent forgiveness of sins for this man who had died on the cross next to him just a little bit later and uh, believe in Christ. He was the first one to get in to the church, the body of Jesus Christ, following the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, he never had a chance to be baptized in water. So there are seven baptisms listed, and in fact, I have a sermon uh, on the seven baptisms where I try to uh, elaborate on each one and how and all they, what they mean and signify. When Paul writes, "For there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism," what he must mean is that there's one true baptism of which all the others are pictures in some way, but they're not. They're not all the same. And every time you see the word baptize or baptism, it doesn't automatically mean water. And if you see water, it doesn't mean baptism by the Spirit. They're two different words. When Paul says, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, that doesn't require any water. There's no water mentioned in that verse. It's a spiritual baptism that happens the moment you trust Christ to save you. You enter into the body of saints, the body of all Christians, all believers. And that's an operation the Holy Spirit carries out uh, in you. Um, I want you to pay careful attention to the words, and with fire, at the end of verse 11. It's misquoted so very often by uh, the Pentecostal brethren and the Charismatics, to like a baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. That's how they say it. Baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Speaking with tongues or some, something else. But um, it's a tragic error, a very unfortunate error. And I say that because an entire movement was launched over 100 years ago based upon misreading the scripture. Look at the end of verse 11. It says... He, Christ, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, comma, and with fire. But the end of verse 11, there's a colon. The sentence continues into verse 12. The sentence continues, verse 12, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The fire, verse 11, is defined in verse 12 as God's wrath. At the second advent, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's not the baptism you want to pray for. <laughs> Put it that way. Um, now, 
the charismatics and charismatic preachers to justify their interpretation of that as being, uh, you know, Holy Ghost uh, speaking with other tongues and so forth. They'll go to Acts chapter 2. So we'll look over there, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Notice there verse, oh, verses 2 and 3. Acts 2, verses 2 and 3. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And so they reason that this is being baptized with fire. And they ignore the definition which followed there in verse 12 back in Matthew 3. But a simile is to make a comparison between two things using the words as and like. Something is like this or it is as that. It's not the same as that, but it's similar to it. And you use those two words like and as here you've got like as of fire in the same clause there in Acts 2 verse 3. So the cloven tongues uh, like as of fire, it wasn't even fire. Whatever it was appeared to them or appeared to their vision over the disciples. It wasn't even real fire, but whatever was seen by the witnesses looked like fire. It appeared like fire and it says like as of fire. So something that's like something else is not the same as being it. It's not the same thing. So that's how they justify their interpretation by Acts chapter 2, verse 3. But to justify John's language, let me have you go back to Isaiah chapter 4. I'm almost finished, I promise. Isaiah 4. Isaiah 4 and verse 4. Isaiah 4, verse 4, When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Uh, go forward to the last book in the Old Testament, Malachi. Or as the Italians say, Malachi. Go to the book of Malachi, chapter 3. <clears throat> Malachi 3, Verse 2. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. The fire uh, baptized with fire, as John mentioned, he clearly defined as the coming uh, wrath of God, the wrath of Jesus Christ when he comes again. And uh, we'll finish up with Paul's words. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 and 8. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, notice, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and so forth. So that justifies John's language fine as far as I can see it. He said he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, comma, and with fire. This is how it's going to be. And he describes it in verse 12 of our text. So, like I said, it's, it's a tragic mistake that people who understood how to be born again, and uh, they loved the Lord Jesus Christ, and they understood how to be, you know, to get saved is a very easy thing to do. It's a very simple proposition. 
admit to God you're a sinner and you know you can't save yourself and trust that Jesus Christ died as your substitute. And on that basis, his righteousness becomes yours. Your sin is put on him and God saves your soul. To get saved is a very simple thing to do. But then after someone gets saved, if you're not very careful with the scriptures, if someone suggests something to you and you're not paying attention to what you're reading, you go off in another direction. You think, well, this must be the baptism of the Holy Spirit. As a King James Bible believer and a Bible-believing church, it's important for us to pay careful attention to every single thing on the page of our Bible. I, it really is. And I don't believe it's our job to change a single word in our Bible. And I even think you let the punctuation stand as it is. Don't even change a punctuation mark. Just take it as it is. And if it's God's book, it's his job to teach it to you by the Holy Spirit. Nowhere in the New Testament does it ever say anyone spoke in tongues. It says they spake with tongues. You don't hammer a nail in the spirit of hammering. You hammer it with a hammer, right? You use it as a tool to affect some job, to accomplish some task. When you are speaking in tongues, it's as though something has overcome you and it's controlling you. But if you speak with tongues and you're in control of it, you use it to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish. And so even that is misstated a lot of times by believers and Bible believers. We, we often hear, because we've heard it so often by our charismatic friends or Pentecostal friends speaking in tongues. Nobody speaks in tongues. They speak with tongues. They're using it to, to do some job for the Lord Jesus Christ, to preach some message for the cause of Christ. 